So I've wanted to make a video about this for my students for a while, and I'm finally kind of getting around to it. But I have been thinking a lot recently about uh, one of my big frustrations with academia, and that is the fact that our research is not generally accessible to people in the general public. And if you're at a public university or funded by a public institution like the NSF, the National Science Foundation, it's the public that's essentially funding your research, and yet they don't, it's not largely accessible to them. So kind of the way I see it, there are two barriers to access as far as academic journal articles go. The first is that people don't have like literal access to it, as in these, you, you're behind a paywall. These journals are incredibly expensive to subscribe to, and unless you're a student at a university, you probably don't have access to these unless you make use of uh, a couple websites that skirt around those. But the other problem, so there's not much that I can do about, about access as far as that goes, but the other problem I feel like is something that us as researchers and academics can do something else about, and that is the fact that the writing is inaccessible. The general public would be very confused reading an academic journal article because we don't write for the general public. We write for each other. And I have, you know, plenty of theories as to why that's the case, but it does, we're essentially gatekeeping knowledge when we're doing this. Uh, it's comes across as performative bluster a lot of the time. Our writing just is not accessible. So what I figured I would do is first of all, go through kind of why academic journal articles are good and important sources of information. And second, kind of teach you the anatomy of a journal article, what that process is like, and how to understand and kind of dissect the information that's in the articles that you find. So as far as why academic journal articles are important to access and understand, and be able to interpret, one, it's the fact that it's a primary source. So what I mean by that is it's not someone else's interpretation of this research that was done. A lot of times now with everything going on in the pandemic and the vaccines and the uh, snake oil treatments, you hear a lot of people saying, do your own research. Academic journal articles, those authors actually literally did do the research rather than reading someone else's research. When someone else is reading this research, there's always the potential to misinterpret it. It's like that game of telephone that you used to play when you were little, where you whispered something into someone's ear and they whispered to someone else and the message gets garbled. So if you can go straight to the source and read from those researchers what it is that they found, you're gonna be in a lot better shape and less prone to being misled. So, um, there is a level of literacy that you kind of need to be able to interpret these journal articles. When I read articles from a different field, like something in, the, in anything STEM, to be honest, because I'm a social science researcher, I'm in the humanities, um, reading engineering articles or medical articles even, I have a hard time interpreting it sometimes, interpreting what their results were. But good authors do help you do some of that interpretation. So I'll show you how and where they do that in just a minute. But the other reason why journal articles are kind of the gold standard for sources as far as new information goes is the fact that they are peer reviewed. So you've probably heard that phrase before, but you might not know what that means really. So I figured I would just kind of explain what the peer review process is so that you might get a better understanding of why people have such high regard for academic journal articles. So let's say that um, I am, here's me, I have been spending the last year working very hard, gathering information, and I have written this manuscript. This is my research, I am so proud of it, and it's time for me to do something with it. So what I do is I send it over to a journal. 
usually I'll look for a journal that is that specializes in my area of study, for example, communication or organizational communication, even more specifically, but also one that matches my methodology. So that means, am I doing interviews or am I like collecting numbers data, word data or numbers data? So I'll choose a journal that kind of caters to or is a good fit for the research that I'm doing. So I send it out to the journal. The first person who reads it is the editor of the journal. The editor has the option to do what's called a desk reject, where they say, nah, we're not really interested. This happens usually when it's clear the research you've submitted is not up to par. Uh, there are like glaring issues, or maybe it's not a good fit for the journal. So this does happen sometimes, but not a whole lot. Usually you don't submit to a journal unless you're pretty sure you're not gonna get a desk reject. So then what they do, the editor chooses three experts in the field or the topic area that my research is on. So for example, when my colleagues and I did research on scientists working on a supercomputer and how they communicated with each other, the, the journal editor chose someone who was an expert in network analysis because that's the method that we were using. It was an expert in those statistics and things like that. So, but also they were all communication scholars. And I think most of them were probably organization communication scholars. The reviewers are anonymous, but a lot of times you, you might have an idea of who it might be. So usually it gets sent to whoop, three reviewers so we're just going to call them reviewer one reviewer two and reviewer three whoop. so these experts in the field then read the manuscript that i have sent and they kind of have three options so they can accept it they can reject it or they could do something in the middle which is called a revise and resubmit or an R&R. &R. This actually hardly ever happens. Like there are whispers about, oh, that person got an automatic exception or accepted into this journal with no, no revisions. Like there are whispers of these things happening at conferences. It's like in the realm of unicorns and fairies. So apparently it happens, but it's super rare. Uh, but sometimes you do get a reject from the reviewers. They each make a recommendation saying, yes, this would be a good fit and it adds to our body of knowledge in this field, or it needs some, I recommend accepting uh, after some either major revisions or minor revisions. So let's say that uh, they decide, okay, this has the potential to do some good work in our field by being published in this journal. And they decide on revise and resubmit. So what they're gonna do now is each reviewer writes a bunch of comments for the author and it gets sent back to me, the author. Then I spend maybe a month going through and addressing all of their revisions. I um, make the changes that they suggest. I might have to rerun some, uh, some analysis or I might have to add more citations or reframe some of my theoretical arguments, whatever it is it's being checked by experts and they send it back to me with recommendations. This is where they'll catch if, you know, the statistical uh, formula you ran really doesn't fit the situation and it's, you know, skewing your data. So it's a good check on the work that we do. So they send it back to me. I make a bunch of revisions. I send it back to those reviewers and um, those reviewers go through it again. They read it again and they decide all over again, are we good? They can also say, never mind, we're not interested anymore. You didn't make the changes that we were looking for. So, but maybe let's say again, they choose on another revise and resubmit. It goes back to me. I send it back to them making the changes. This process can go back and forth two, three times and it can last a really long time anywhere from you know if you have really fast reviewers that get your feedback to you really quickly and you're really quick in making those changes maybe this publication process is a, a three-month process to to the reviews and then another few months until the next journal article comes out 
So best case scenario, you're looking at three months from the time you submit to the time it's published. Well, six months really, best case scenario. A lot of times this review process can take maybe a year. Um, it really just depends on a whole bunch of different factors. But that means that there is inherently this sort of lag built into research. So one of the downsides of the peer review process is the fact that it sometimes just takes a really long time. And when you're in a situation where kind of time is important and you need this research, for example, now when we're in the middle of a pandemic, what you might get is something called preprints. And preprints are is research that didn't quite go through the full peer review process. It's been read by an expert in the field, but it hasn't undergone that rigorous, rigorous revise and resubmit, the checking of from various experts in the field. But in cases like the coronavirus, sometimes you really can't wait a year to get this research out there and to get it to other scientists. Because another cool thing about publishing is that when you publish, you go from those three reviewers as experts in your field, reviewing it and checking it to the entire field, checking it for accuracy and validity and reliability and things like that. So you can get preprints, but they haven't undergone that same rigorous peer review process yet. So now that you kind of understand the, the peer review process and why that adds to kind of the credibility of academic journal articles, we're going to talk a little bit about how to read one of these academic journal articles. The cool thing about them is that they tend to follow a really predictable formula. Writing these journal articles is really formulaic. They're almost always in the same order and they have the same parts to them. So if you can learn to read those parts and know what they do, you are well on your way to being able to kind of start to comprehend what it is that this research is trying to say. So the first thing that you're going to see in a journal article is the abstract. So this is just a one paragraph summary of the most important like highlights. A lot of times this is what you'll read to decide, is this the type of information that I'm looking for or is this not going to be helpful for me? So after your abstract, you'll get into your introduction. This essentially just frames the research and says, it, it motivates it. it, says here's why this research is important, here's the gap that it fills in our knowledge. Then you'll get to the literature review. Now the literature review won't be labeled literature review. It will have um, probably a bunch of different subsections that have to do with theory or previous work that's been done in this area. The purpose of the literature review is really to tell your reader where are you positioned right now kind of in our body of knowledge what theories are you have or previous research you have in conversations with um, where does your research fit into our knowledge and how does it fill a gap in this knowledge that we have so a lot of times if you are just um, looking for information for say a speech in my class or looking for new research, a lot of times you'll end up skipping that literature review. And that's okay. <laughs> because they are dense, they are theory heavy, especially in the social sciences. So unless you need to understand the theory and how they're developing their measures and things like that, and the previous research that they're building upon, it's okay to skip the literature review. So that introduction in the literature review really forms like the first half of a journal article. So after you get through all the theory, all of that heady stuff, you get to the methods. So this is where the researchers explain, here's how we chose who we were going to sample, for example. Here's how we chose who was going to take our survey. Here's how we make sure that it is a random sample or it's a theoretically driven purposeful sample. So if you are familiar with research methods, this is an important 
a pretty important section for you. But again, a lot of times if you are just looking for um, information for my class, for example, for your round three or four speech, you don't have to get into the methods. So then we get into the good stuff. After that, you'll get into the findings or results. Uh, they, it, you can kind of interchange those two words, but you would think this was the most important part of, and the most interesting part of the article, but I'll tell you why it's not. So a lot of times the findings and results are just the bare bones, here's what we found. If it's a quantitative study, it's gonna be a lot of numbers and a lot of formulas. Um, if it's not, if it's qualitative research, it's still going to be just kind of bare bones, maybe quotes, themes that they found, things like that. But then you get into the discussion section. And I argue that the discussion section is actually more useful for most people than the findings and results because your discussion section interprets those findings. Like I said, when I read um, a medical a journal or an article published in a medical journal, I don't have the expertise to really interpret and understand those findings. But in the discussion section, the authors help you do that and they do a lot of that work for you. So the discussion section is well where they will interpret and kind of make sense of here what here's what we found. And so what? They give you that so what, which is really important. You'll also probably find some helpful stuff in the conclusion, so it's definitely worth skimming over that. But if you are trying to tackle an academic journal article for the first time, my advice is to start with the discussion section and the conclusion. Um, oh, two other important things the discussion sections do is they usually either have its own section or they mention it somewhere in it, but they talk about implications. That's that so what that I was talking about. How can we apply these findings? Why do these uh, findings matter? The second thing that they do is address limitations, which is so important to understanding research and understanding it responsibly. So limitation sections say, here's the conclusions that we can draw from this research. Here are the conclusions that we cannot draw. A lot of times you'll see um, the author saying this suggests a strong correlation, but does not prove causation. So um, if you're a student of mine, that should sound familiar from round three. And that's where you will find, is it a causal link or is it a correlative link? So that's all in the discussion section, super useful. So let's see how this usually works. We'll kind of go through an article and you can see it happening. Okay, so here is um, an article that was published relatively recently. So you'll see right here, we start off with our abstract. Here's just a super quick one paragraph uh, summary of what this research does. So then we get into our introduction. All of this is our introduction. And then we get to the literature review. So this is where they lay out, here's all the theory that we're building on. Here's how we understand things now. Here's how we're going to build on that understanding. So they, this is research about collective emotion during uh, collective trauma. So <clears throat> they start talking about uh, mental models of collective trauma, metaphors and emotional expression, and then benefits of collective emotion expression. Great. And then we find this cool little spot right here where they lay out their research questions. Here are the questions that we're trying to answer. And then again, we get to that method section. So that was next, remember? Oh, sorry. So our method section then talks about participants. Who were they? Who was involved in the study? Uh, they talk about recruitment. They talk about kind of demographics and psychographics of this population that they're studying. Then they tell us how they collected their data, how they analyzed their data. 
So after our methods section, remember, we get to findings. See, this is a very Sarah Tracy, who's one of the authors, thing to do, ensuring qualitative rigors. Like, what did we do to ensure that we were being responsible with this data and interpreting it in a responsible way and not just cherry picking results? Love this section. So we get to our findings section. They talk, we, they have uh, examples from the themes that they found in their qualitative data. They talk a little bit more about that participant mental models, grief, disgust, anger, and then here is what we're looking for, our discussion section. So this is where they interpret those findings. So what does it mean, these things that they found? Why are these things important? Uh -uh. We go through all that discussion section and then we get to the conclusion. Let's see if they have, ah, here's our implications. So here's why it matters. And then right after that, like I mentioned, limitations. And a lot of times you'll have future directions. So here's what this research is not able to say. We're not quite able to conclude this stuff, but future research should look into X, Y, Z. So this stuff will always be towards the end of the article, right before the conclusion. And the conclusion just ties a nice little bow on it. So if you can kind of understand the anatomy of the article and realize that you don't have to start at the very beginning. If you're not reading, if your intention is not to get full understanding, full comprehension and be sort of an expert in this area, you don't have to read the whole article. It's okay for you to skim the abstract, see if it's useful. If it is, go to the discussion section. That's fine. I would caution you against just right reading the findings section because, again, you're prone to misinterpreting what it is that that data means. So let the authors help you with that. Go to the discussion section where they help you interpret those findings and those numbers. So that kind of wraps up the, the anatomy of a journal article and how to approach it. Um, there was one more thing that I wanted to touch on really quickly, just because, again, this is something that um, most people, unless you're doing research in academia, you don't know much about it. And I'm all about opening those black boxes today. So uh, we're going to talk about what an IRB is. So an IRB is uh, stands for Institutional Review Board. And this is something that anyone who publishes in a journal or presents at a conference has to abide by. You have to get your research approved by an IRB if it involves human subjects. Even if I'm just giving a survey to people and having them answer it, I have to get that approved by the Institutional Review Board. And their job is to make sure that we are not causing harm to our, to our participants, that our participants are um, agreeing to participate in this research without coercion, they're of sound mind, and that we are taking measures to protect both them and their data. So in the type of research that I do, it's usually not that big of a deal, but sometimes this stuff is really important. Even if you're not in the medical field, you have the potential to harm participants by causing them undue distress, for example. So the Institutional Review Board approves all of the research that gets published. So this is the IRB application and approval for my dissertation that I did a few years ago, but I just wanted to run you through it real quick so that you see the processes that academic research goes through to get checked by others, to be vetted, to make sure we're doing things the right way, that we're doing things responsibly. So uh, we start off by giving a research summary. Here's what it is that I want to learn. Here's what it is that I'll be doing. Uh, then you outline your participants. Who all is going to be participating in your research? And you give them kind of ballpark numbers. Um, this part, let's see here, starts to get really interesting when you talk about vulnerable populations. So are these people literate? Are they able to read and understand this 
uh, informed consent form you're giving them. Are they non-English speaking? Do they have disabilities? Uh, pregnant or lactating women, human fetuses and neonates, that's usually for medical research. That's why pregnant women are so often excluded from medical studies. Um, because it's just an, it's another step in the IRB that you have to go to because they're a vulnerable population. Uh, prisoners are also considered vulnerable populations because they are, um, they're prone to undue coercion. So also Milgram and not Milgram, uh, the prison experiment, Stanford prison experiment. Who is that? That's not Milgram. Milgram was the shocking. Okay. So you explain all of this. Are you going to withhold information? Like, are you tricking them? Uh, inclusion and exclusion. At what point would we exclude someone from participating? Research procedures. So I tell them I'm going to do interviews. I'm going to do ethnography. I'm going to do field work. I'll be recording audio. I'll be doing observations. So I describe all of that. Um, will subjects receive inducements or rewards? before or after. So are, are you paying your participants? And how do you make sure that someone who doesn't really want to participate but is desperate for money is participating in this research? Uh, then we get to how are you going to protect your participants and their privacy and all of their information? So we say, you know, we're going to keep it under lock and key. We're going to give them code names. Only two people will have access to the code book. Um, all of this stuff. So, oh, and then since I was doing research in a workplace, I had to get into um, how I'm going to protect them in their workplace. The, they were telling me, they were being very open about their experience working there. And they were being, you know, if they want to be critical of the company and their bosses, then I need to make sure that I'm protecting them. So, it's important that you assure your participants of this protection so that they are less afraid to be open with you and answer your questions truthfully. Um, so that means I also had to be really clear that you participating or not participating in this research that does not have any bearing on your employment here, your promotion, anything like that. So we go through all of that. We have an in, we have participants sign an informed consent form. Uh, this is where we outline risks and benefits. Are there any risks to the participants? Their well-being, privacy, dignity, self-respect, psyche, emotions, reputation, employability, criminal, criminal and legal status. Uh, so it's not just physical harm. It's also it, harm broadly defined. Uh, what steps are you taking to minimize that risk? So all of this gets uh, reviewed by the Institutional Review Board at our university. And a lot of times they'll send you something back kind of like a revise and resubmit and say, hey, you need to make these changes. Um, but you also have to submit, uh, oh, I had to get approval from the IRB at the organization because they also had an IRB. Um, then you have to submit, how are you going to recruit them? Give me the copy of the recruitment email. Um, my follow-up emails, and then you have to submit um, interview guides. What questions are you going to ask them? And then this is the informed consent form that every participant has to sign that outlines things like what are the potential risks? What are the benefits to taking part in this research? Why are you having me do this? How are you going to protect my privacy? Are you going to pay me? Things like that. So if you are ever um, participating in academic research, good research, and they don't have you sign an informed consent form, that should be a red flag. It's maybe not rigorous academic research to be published and shared widely with the public. And that means it hasn't gone through these checks that IRB approved studies have. So I know I just covered a whole lot and that was so much longer than I meant it to be. But I would say the, the first half of this video is the important part, especially if you're a student of mine and that's why you're here. Um, why understanding why academic journal articles are sort of the gold standard and why they're useful and how to understand them. Don't let us gatekeep information. Academics love 
writing for other academics and not for the general public. And that's not the way it should be. You should be able to understand the research it is that we're doing. I can't change the whole paywall access thing, but I can give you a couple tools in your toolbox so that you are more comfortable in your ability to go understand some of this research that's going on. So hopefully that was a little bit helpful. And um, I th hopefully we're, we're moving more towards an open access kind of uh, framework in academia where our research is not behind a paywall. But, oh, if it is, if you ever find research that you're super interested in, email the authors. They'll probably send you a copy of that paper. Uh, I've definitely done that before. A lot of times I can't publish the final, final, final version, but maybe I'll publish like the third revise and resubmit that I did. By publish, I mean put it like on my website or something like that. But you can always email the auth one of the authors and ask them. But again, don't let us gatekeep this information. The way that we write fancy is just performative bluster. Good writers, good researchers will write in ways that are easy to understand and not in purple prose, fancy words for no reason. Don't let us get, keep this information anymore. You have what it takes to be able to understand these articles. Have a good one. <laughs>